and welcome to Global Policy Forum's video series. This is an interview with Ambassador Anmural Chowdhury. Ambassador Chowdhury presided over the UN Security Council and the UN Fifth Committee. In this interview, Ambassador Chowdhury covers his experiences of working within these institutions. On October 31st, 2000, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 1325, recognizing women's role in peace and security. A strong advocate for instilling policies that prevent armed conflict, Ambassador Chowdhury played a primal role in the passing of the resolution. It was a unique moment for the UN Security Council, not only because of the subject matter, but also because of the role that Bangladesh, as a non-permanent elected member of the Security Council, played in bringing about Resolution 1325, played in bringing about the resolution. The interview concludes with Ambassador Chowdhury's personal recommendations to future non-permanent elected members to the UN Security Council, in which he focuses on the role that civil society can play in creating change. Ambassador Chowdhury, you chaired the UN Fifth Committee, the Administrative and Budgetary Committee, between 1997 and 1998. Can you talk about your experiences? I believe Fifth Committee is the heart of the United Nations. That keeps the UN going because whatever reforms are proposed by the Secretary General or the Member States, the Fifth Committee has an opportunity to enhance it, to strengthen it or to undermine it and that is what has happened. The General Assembly can take a very wonderful Millennium Declaration but its implementation in the real sense can only be possible if Fifth Committee is equally energized and has a sense of broader perspective that will make the Millennium Goals be implemented in the true sense. No reform is possible unless we have Fifth Committee on board fully and that connection can be made only if the permanent representatives, senior delegates take interest in the Fifth Committee. Fifth Committee is too important to be left to junior officers who would not even bother to consult their heads of delegation in terms of the position that they are taking. None of the previous chairmen of this committee had been at the level of a permanent representative. And I felt if this committee is the most important committee, uh, it should be uh, handled by uh, or headed by an ambassador. First committee had always been headed by their disarmament. So traditionally, the, the ambassadors, the permanent representatives went for those committees. The disinterest of the permanent representatives in this committee's work is also one of the reasons why the even reforms have not moved with energy and enthusiasm and engagement. So that is why I thought this is a moment of uh, opportunity for me. I know the issues, I know the, the actors, so maybe I can do that. So when the turn for the Asian group came to head this committee, uh, Bangladesh showed interest and uh, I was selected. That was coincidentally the first year uh, the new Secretary General of the United Nations at that time Kofi Annan and his first reform proposals were incorporated in the budget that was presented to my committee. Uh, so this budget was for 98-99 and to be approved in 97. Uh, UN budget and the scale of assessment are two of the most contentious things in the fifth committee. Uh, dollars and cents are involved in it. Um, uh, UN running is decided by the budget and the member states involvement is decided by the scale of assessment. Every six years these two items come at the same session. It is very very important that the permanent representatives should give time and energy to this committee. They should participate, they should understand, they should sort of uh, be the lead 
players in the committee's deliberations. Uh, it has not happened so far. And when I became the chairman of the fifth committee, many of my colleagues were teasing me, saying that it seems you have nothing better to do by chairing the fifth committee. But I think my engagement and my efforts ensured that from my time onwards now, every session, the fifth committee is chaired by a permanent representative. And I believe that this by itself is a big contribution that I could make to the, the running of this committee uh, and in the context of the UN reforms. Thank you, Ambassador Chaudhry. I would now like to move to the Security Council. I know that Bangladesh was elected to the UN Security Council for the first time in 1978 and then again in 2000 when you were Bangladesh's permanent representative to the United Nations. Could you talk about your experiences at these times? The two occasions when Bangladesh was a member of the Security Council. The first one was four years after our membership uh, in 1978 we, we fought the election for, and I was uh, in charge of the election process as a director in the foreign ministry for the United Nations. And then we had uh, the big contest with Japan, whom we defeated. And Japan was going for, I think, its third or fourth term as a member of the Security Council, and they could not believe that this poor, newly independent country, within four years of its membership, would be able to defeat powerhouse like Japan. And uh, I believe that the defeat resulted in Japan's change in, in the dimensions and directions of its foreign policy in a big way because they felt that they neglected Asia for a long time and then they started refocusing on the Asian group and the Asian members. The second term of course when I was a uh, member and uh, we were endorsed by the Asian group, in that election uh, Bangladesh got the highest vote among the countries elected to the Security Council. So that was a big honor for us and big satisfaction. So I believe that the, the non-permanent members who come to the Security Council for a two-year term, they contribute in much substantive way in the, the work of the uh, Security Council and also make a longer term impression on the kind of mark that they leave during their two-year term. Bangladesh came in with the clear thought that the previous membership was 20 years ago. And given the interest of all countries these days, no developing country could expect to come back in the Security Council before maybe average period would be 20 years gap. The same thing happened during our membership. Tunisia and Jamaica came in with the same time frame 20 years later. So Jamaica, Bangladesh, Tunisia all served in the same time in 79 and then we came back after 20 years in 2000 to, to serve as members of the Security Council. So we come with a big determination to make our mark, to leave our mark there. And I, we believe that that's a good enthusiasm for the Security Council to be reformed because those who are there permanently they never want things to change because it works for them and they, if necessary, they can change whenever it needed. But they are there permanently. So the status quo helps them. But for us, we believe that this is an opportunity of lifetime. And really, after this two-year term in 2000 and 2001, we do not know when Bangladesh will come back again. When we came in, two things became very prominent in, during our membership. One was to make the Security Council as open to everybody as possible. Make it open and transparent. So all the documents of the Security Council, even draft resolutions and other papers, we put, a, put those on our website. I used to speak to the media and uh, to other delegations very openly that this is the what is happening, this is what our effort is. Not in a negative way, in a positive way to make people understand what is happening within those 15 countries in a closed atmosphere. 
because most of the Security Council open meetings are just formal meetings. The real deals are made inside uh, a closed meeting uh, and maybe uh, even outside the closed meeting. This was our objective and second objective was to make as many meetings as possible as open meetings. We had at that time in March 2000 when uh, I was the president of the Security Council, we had the maximum number of open meetings on record at that time. So we had decided that if Bangladesh is a member of the council, why am I going to block other future members of the council to be part of our meetings? Today I am a member, tomorrow I will not be a member, and today's non-member is tomorrow's member. So I believe that openness always helps the council's deliberations, knowledge, understanding, and also they are preparing themselves to become member next time. These were the two objectives and I believe that both of those were fulfilled in a big way and also substantively we had uh, 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 moved uh, one of the issues which has become now a major uh, rallying ground for uh, international community as a whole that is the, the political and the conceptual breakthrough we made during our presidency in March 2000 in terms of recognizing women's role in the area of peace and security. And we also emphasized that the equality between women and men is an essential element in achieving peace and security. Our focus was on how we can enable the Security Council in a better way to achieve sustainable peace. Not a peace uh, which is very temporary, which uh, unravels within few months of the peace agreement. So our opportunity was to involve people and in that context mainly empower women to be part of all decision making, uh, at all decision making levels to engage in in the work of promoting peace and security. And the United Nations need to do that. You cannot uh, ask for more equipments, more peacekeepers, more vehicles, more helicopters for keeping peace. To use those equipments, the United Nations Security Council has not engaged itself in trying to see how we can create the, the atmosphere for promoting peace and security, how we can create the culture of peace which is needed, uh, particularly in the work of the Security Council. Security Council comes in only when conflicting parties have agreed to sign a peace agreement and then we send in peacekeeping force to s sort of separate the two parties and ensure that the agreement is implemented. We near, need to create through the decisions of the Security Council an earning in the minds of people, all people, whether you are in conflict or not, because I believe today I may not be in conflict, but situation might arise in a way that our region or our countries would be involved in conflict. So. These days, either you are uh, countries which are coming out of conflict, or countries which are engaged in conflict, or countries which are potential areas for conflict. So that is why we should engage the United Nations in a much uh, uh, determined way in building the culture of peace. That is what is necessary. The four plus billion dollars that we spend for peacekeeping forces, uh, even 10% of that amount will create bigger opportunities for the United Nations to be successful, the Security Council to be meaningful in its own work. So that is very important. That's why we felt that when uh, in March 
we could get a recognition for the women's involvement uh, in peace and security, uh, I believe that it advanced the Security Council's opportunity. But Security Council is still stuck on the old model of security, the traditionalist model, which is military uh, oriented. And I believe that that has to change. The program of action on culture of peace provides a wonderful opportunity identifying eight areas of action, starting with education, economic and social development, human rights, equality between women and men, creating understanding, solidarity and tolerance among people. So all these things are very important. And that is where the focus of the Security Council should be. Security Council also needs to address security from the point of view of human security. The state security has dominated the work of the Security Council and the United Nations in general. But we need to focus on human dimension of security. To some extent, we have been able to do that by identifying advisor for women's rights, advisor for child rights, advisor for uh, civilian dimensions, refugees. We need to make human security the main focus of our action in the Security Council. Ambassador Chowdhury, a lot of commentators have spoken about the extent of influence the permanent representatives, the US, UK, France, China and Russia have in informing the UN Security Council agenda. Can you speak to Bangladesh's experiences as a non-permanent member in the Security Council? When we became a member in 2000, before that I did a kind of a look into the actions which were taken by the non-permanent members over the years in the Security Council in general along with the permanent members. And my research told me that it is the two-year non-permanent members who contributed more to the effectiveness and efficiency of the Security Council than the permanent members. Many of these two-year members were less powerful countries, less economically developed countries like Bangladesh. And Bangladesh, during our second presidency in 2001, we initiated this, this resolution with regard to prevention of armed conflict, which finally was adopted. Ambassador Chaudhry, you and the Bangladeshi mission were very innovative in bringing issues pertaining to women, peace and security to the agenda of the Security Council. In spite of the imbalanced structure of the Security Council, a structure that clearly favours the permanent members, what would your advice be to future non-permanent elected members to the Security Council? I think one important message I like to convey to the, the future members of the, the Security Council is to see their membership in a much broader context, not solely from their national point of view. The moment you are bogged down in your national agenda, then your creativity and imagination are compromised. Many of the, the permanent members go directly to the national capital with their security council position. My country left the initiative to be taken in New York between the two delegations. The ambassadors should get full support from back home. They should not be at the mercy of the bilateral relations which takes place in the Security Council issues or UN issues in general. And also very important for the Security Council members to keep in touch closely with civil society. That advisor I will strongly leave with the incoming members of the Security Council. I have personally benefited from my interaction with civil society, my relationship with them and my sharing of what is happening in the Security Council with them. We owe it to civil society to share what we are doing in the United Nations.